Hello and welcome to Student Hub Live. I'm Rob Moore and I'm a regular on the Student Hub Live workshops. Uh, if you've joined us there before, you may have seen me there with Isabella. Uh, I've been let free. She's not here to turn my microphone off this time. So I've been released from the chat box and you get to see me. So let's play. These sessions are slightly different to the sessions we have in the workshops in Adobe Connect. Um, we have some guests and we have some experts looking after the chat. So you'll know the experts in the chat because they will have Student Hub Live in front of their names. So looking after the chat, we have Nicola. Uh, Nicola's an experienced tutor. She works in the business school and she was my mentor when I started teaching in the master's program 16 years ago. So it's great to have Nicola here with us today. You've also got Amanda and Amanda's a new member of the uh, Student Hub Live team. So Amanda will be popping up in the workshops as we carry them on through the rest of the year. And HJ, you probably recognize. HJ is our regular uh, live broadcast um, host. And he, he's going to be bringing your thoughts and comments to me as we go through. Then as well as the guests looking after the chat, we've got some guests on camera as well. But we've got Paul. Paul's a very experienced tutor. And again, Paul's one of those tutors I've learned from over my 20 years working for the Open University. The subject today is learning from experts. And I've got two of the experts I've learned from here with me. Then we've got Lynn, who's a qualified solicitor and she tutors Hello. in our law school. And um, Lynn's got some great insights on how ideas are used in our legal system. And then finally on camera, we've got Margaret. So Margaret's another member of our Student Hub Live team, and you'll be seeing Margaret in the workshops as we go forwards. Uh, as well as running her own business, Margaret is actually a world record holder. She <laughs> holds the record for completing a million meters on an indoor rower in 14 days. And she's got some <laughs> other challenges coming up, which you can come and find out about in the live sessions. So today's session is all about learning from other people's ideas. As we go through, we want you to get involved. We want you to be involved in the chat so we can see the messages that you're sending through. And just looking at a few now, I can see that it's raining in Portugal, which makes me feel very smug here in the Midlands because we've got beautiful sunshine. It's, it's one of the three days a year we get beautiful sunshine. Um, but yeah, please keep sending in your messages and those will be passed on to us. Uh, what I'd like you to be careful of, though, is not to put any personal information in the messages. Uh, feel free to comment on other people's posts and uh, feedback, but no personal information, please. This isn't a closed system, so treat it as, a, as an open notice board. If you want to send us an email, then you'll see the email address on the screen studenthub at open.ac.uk and we'd love to hear from you as we go through. Now this session builds on the earlier sessions that we've had on interpreting ideas from the module and we're focusing really on how we can take the ideas of others and how we can build them into our own work and our own assignments. So we've got a few topics to deal with and in the first topic, we've called it standing on the shoulders of giants. And you'll notice there's a question on the screen, if you'd like to answer it, that looks at uh, where you can tell us about situations where you think it might be useful to use the ideas of others. And this is where I'm going to bring my experts in. So I'm going to ask each of my uh, panel members in turn to think about their own area of expertise as a tutor and tell us how we might use the ideas of experts and academics and other sources in their own work. So Paul, I'm going to come to you first. So if you'd like, a, like to introduce yourself quickly, then tell us about where you think we can use the ideas of experts and academics. Okay, lovely. Thanks, Rob. Um, okay, I'm Paul Ketchley. I work in the business school. Um, I was an OU student years and years ago. 
Uh, before that, I went to, uh, I, I did a sociology degree at Bath. And um, so I guess that my, my starting point would be that actually uh, being a university student is all about um, learning to use the ideas of established authors and the ideas that are recognised in your course of study. And so that's why uh, what we want you to do is to understand the material that you've been studying and to weigh it all up and then come to your own conclusion and then write out and explain the conclusion that you've come to. So it's really about um, drawing on the range of material that you'll find covered in the course, uh, recognising that there are always debates and then weighing that up and coming to a conclusion. So, as I say, um, really and truly, the whole basis of academic study is understanding the ideas covered in the course and using that to build your argument. So, I would say that's where it starts from. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Um, so, Margaret, can you give us some of the focus where you might be encouraging students to use the ideas of others? Yeah. Um in science, any one person can't know all of science. And so you have to stand on the shoulders of others to be able to understand science. So if you go back thousands of years, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of, you know, important scientists in the Greek times and um, it, from and, and, and North Africa and all over the world, those ideas started to build up. And each idea builds on the ideas before it. And so you have to be able to, look at other people's ideas and say well um that idea isn't standing on its own it's coming from all that rest of that information that's behind it um and in, in science we kind of have a gold standard of something that you would use to say this idea is respected and accepted and that would be a research paper that's been reviewed by other people that work in the area so we would call that a peer-reviewed research paper and that would be our gold standard of what you would use to then look at the science of other people um, the second one it would also be a patent as well. That would also be another area in science and technology where you would be using the work of others to then say, well, that's what that person's done with their um, invention or idea. How would I then move forward to create something new myself? So those are our kind of two gold standards within science and engineering, um, research papers and patents. Brilliant. Thank you, Margaret. And, and Lynn, in the... Um... In the law school then, I'm, I'm guessing you use other people's ideas a lot. So what are the key areas where you, you might be encouraging that? Yeah, very much we use ideas about that. You'll have to forgive me, I'm a little bit croaky this morning. Hopefully uh, my, my voice will last. Um, very much we, we look. Uh, we, we do, of course, look at research papers. Uh, we do look at what academics have written, a uh, uh, peer-reviewed um, research. Uh, but a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the um, uh, people whose shoulders we stand on are, are the judiciary. Uh, we look very much at at case law to support what we're saying. If I'm uh, when I was practicing as a solicitor, when I was in court, uh, I would be making an argument before the judge. The judge is not really interested in what I think, you know, who's who's she? What authority does she hold? So I want something, I want a giant um, that I can say, well, look, um, his view is this, and I'm relying on his view, often what another judge has said, to support what I say. So we've, we're very similar to, 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 to the other disciplines, uh, but we, we do have some very specialist uh, giants um, whose shoulders that we stand on in, in the law school. <laughs> Absolutely. I, and I, I'm sure that nothing that uh, we do in the business school is likely to uh, decide whether somebody goes to prison or not. So it uh, definitely, absolutely. I think there's a, a, <laughs> a certain extra level there in the, in the law school. Uh, just a couple of points that are coming through on the chat. Um, so Martine is talking about using evidence for assignments. Absolutely. Uh, Joe's mentioning that we can contrast different points and we can use other people's ideas. New skills and ideas are great, Joanne. 
And Louise, I definitely recognize a business studies student there. Cycles of inquiry, looking at hypotheses and taking things a step forward. Excellent. And I did notice Vanessa's comment earlier about uh, knowing what the naughty boy on the um, the workshops looks like in the flesh. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, so coming on to the next point then, um, this is for you, Margaret. Uh, we're using the ideas of others. So why is it important to check the validity of our sources? Um, okay, thanks, Rob. So um, you have to think about it as a chain of links between yourself and the person that actually created the information. So right at the top of those links would be a primary source, the actual person or that it actually created the information. So that would be where you'd start with your um, referencing. They would be the gold standard starting point, the primary source. But obviously most of us can't read or listen to all of those primary sources. So example of primary source would be a research paper, an autobiography, a diary, um, the law itself, mm -hmm. a poem, a painting, um, letters from a particular time. It's it's basically what's been that point in time. So that would be the ideal if you could look at all those primary sources. But the situation is there are so many of them that most of the time, or we don't even have access to them, you know, so we're not, not necessarily have access to them. So then you rely on the next level down, which would be a secondary source, which would be somebody that has seen or heard um, the actual primary source and their thoughts and um, uh, ideas about that initial primary source. So that's the second level down. And, and if you're referencing, a lot of what you reference will be at that level, the secondary source, people that have seen or heard that primary source. But then we get an, a level down still, people that haven't actually seen the, or heard the, the primary source themselves, they're relying on the people who have the secondary sources and they're kind of the tertiary sources. So these are people that are still gonna link back all the way back up to that primary source. Um, and they can, the referencing that they put there will show those links and you could follow those links back yourself, stepping back in time um, to find that primary source. So that's still a valence if you're a student, a tertiary source, so long as you can look at their trail of evidence and make sure that it leads back to the primary source. And then we come to the final source of evidence, which is um, what you might call hearsay or gossip. It doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. So for instance, as a scientist, I might quote Newton's first law of motion. I have never read Newton's work. I have been told that that's what it is, but I can't actually make that link back to myself necessarily um, that to prove that I know it. So I might put that in my document without checking that source. And therefore, although the link may be correct, it may be a true fact, I haven't got that that evidence, and this is what you're doing as a student, you need to make sure you have that evidence that you've got that link in that chain all the way back to that primary source. So really as a student, it's about evaluating those sources. Thank you, Margaret, that's, that's brilliant. And uh, I don't know how many of you are like me, enjoy the, the program QI. Uh, what, one of the, my favorite episodes is when they do the, the, um, the bit where they look back at facts that were right when we told you, but aren't right anymore. And they have to review what's actually true. And I, I do enjoy those, uh, those types of things. Um, so Lynn, just coming to you now, looking at um, using different sources to gain different perspectives. So if you can give us some uh, examples of that, that'd be brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, of course, there's always more than one side to a story. And, and uh, in, in law, we know that only too well. Uh, when I go to court, there's always, uh, I'm arguing from one perspective, somebody else will be arguing from another perspective. So it's really important when you, uh, w w when you're writing one of your assignments, when you're researching, when you're looking for material to put in, one, in your assignments, to look at different sources, to get different views. When you start, go into it with an open mind. Um, don't go in with a closed mind thinking uh, you already know what the answer is, what your conclusion is going to be. You'll be using various resources. You'll be doing, you'll be looking um, at, at 
predominantly to start with your OU materials from the modules. You also might be looking um, at, at textbooks, at your given textbook, and maybe some directed reading. Uh, later on in your studies, you may well be asked to do your own independent re research. Um, but it's really important to remember to look at things from different points of view. Uh, I, I often suggest to my students that they might want to put a, a different hat on, an imaginary hat on, depending on which side of the argument that they're looking from. And, and then they can uh, go back to what Margaret was saying, to evaluate, to weigh up the different evidence um, that, that they've got. So um, yeah, remember to keep an open mind, look at things from different perspectives and wear two different hats, maybe sometimes even three different hats. <laughs> oh, that takes me back to uh, De Bono's six thinking hats is a theory we used to use <laughs> a lot. And um, one of my colleagues got really excited and went and bought six different coloured hats that she made yeah. people wear, yeah. which was, yeah. uh, was really good. Uh, I'm going to come to Paul next, but once we've uh, once Paul's um, talked to us, uh, we're going to be going to HJ. So if you've got any questions or comments around standing on the shoulders of giants, if you get them in now, then we'll be able to pick them up um, after Paul. So Paul, uh, thinking about using other people's ideas, how do we deal with conflicting ideas? And how do we make sure that we don't just pick the ideas that suit us? Well, thanks, Rob. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this really follows on from what Lynn's just said, and I, and I, I entirely understand what she's saying, because um, and it's actually it's quite topical because I, I actually marked an assignment last night, and it was perfectly obvious that this student had decided in advance what the outcome was going to be, and had selected very carefully evidence that supported that particular proposal and had ignored and discounted and didn't even mention uh, other possibilities. And so, you know, basically, um, uh, I remember years ago, my, uh, my research methods tutor at Bath, he had this phrase that, you know, what is, what is research not about? And he said, um, it's not about the approach where you, uh, you know, you operate on, don't confuse me with the facts, I've made up my mind already. And unfortunately, that still applies. All too often, you people don't do what Lynn's just said. They start out um, because it's it's all over social media, isn't it? This is how we do things these days. They start out with a predetermined view, select the evidence that supports that view, but don't mention the other bits. So I think what Lynn just said really is about keeping an, starting with an open mind recognizing and, and including all the different points of view, and then trying to explain why one view is better than the others. And, and I think what she's just said about wearing different hats, keeping an open mind, and not making your mind up before you, you get to the, you know, you've been through all the evidence is, is, is very important. It's a key part of academic study. Absolutely, Paul. And that critical thinking, that ability to look at the yeah. different perspectives, it's a skill that um, you actually develop as a student with the OU. You, you, when you first start with us, then yes, you are selecting uh, evidence and examples that support your view. But as you go through, you, you bring in this ability to look at things from different angles and to put aside your own initial ideas. So... Thank you. Then. That's fantastic. Now, HJ, what's happening in the chat? What sort of uh, questions are we getting there? Well, as always, there's loads of things going on in the mm. chat, which is great to see. We were talking about earlier about how sunny it's looking, which is absolutely amazing. <laughs> it seems a bit uh, it flipped around, though. It's rainy in Portugal, but sunny over here. I don't know what's going on, but I'm very <laughs> pleased to be in sunny South Wales today. So we've been talking about um, the validity of our sources and what we do and the kind of things that we look for in the chat. So Tamara has a look if it's peer reviewed as a good sign to be 
something's been questioned and interrogated and tried out again. And Natasha says, isn't Wikipedia a bit like gossip, at least a little bit? I mean, anyone could go on and edit and change things. So maybe that's not the most valid source that we'd use in our academic work. Uh, Tamara's says, uh, we've got to change it's not bias so written for a company by example so we see times when scientific papers are sponsored by big companies makes you question a little bit where the impartiality is at and then Amanda says uh, for law we tend to advise against using Wikipedia as a source as the information can be outdated and relates to you USA systems as opposed to UK and I think that's um brings on a good point about context as well. So when we're looking at some sources of information, it may be appropriate and valid if we're coming from one context, whereas if we're coming from another context, it may not be appropriate or valid. And uh, as Zad said, an open mind is appropriate for the open university. So when we're looking at different sources of information, mm -hmm. it's good to keep an open mind, ponder on these things, test them ourselves, interrogate them. I think that's really important. And I think um, finally, Douglas has a fantastic question that um, I think would be great for our guests to have a think about. So Douglas says, how can we navigate different or conflicting view when there is not one recognized or authoritative view? What do we think? Oh, wow. So a good question there, which I'll, I'll come to. So the, um, the thing about Wikipedia is I don't want to say Wikipedia is not useful. I think there's a problem if you're using it as a, a source that is your only source. But I find Wikipedia is good for inspiration where I can use it as a launching pad to then go and find some other sources. So um, we don't want to see Wikipedia necessarily referenced in your assignments, but I don't tell students not to go to it. Just make sure they use it to get to more valid sources. And then we come to that question about what do you do if there isn't a particularly uh, recognized source that you can use? And this is actually another skill that you develop, the ability to judge the value of a source that you're using. Now, a, a piece of gossip or a piece of hearsay that you use is still a source of information and you can still use it. But what you have to do is you have to put it in the context of how much you can trust the information, where it's come from, and if there are any biases. So you can use lots and lots of ideas. How you use them and the extent to which you put trust into them that's what we're marking you on. That's what we're actually looking for you to show us. Do you just openly trust everything? Or do you actually focus on and make a judgment on the quality of the source? So that's the first topic done. We're going to go on to this second topic now. And I've called it, it ain't what you say, it's the way that you say it. So how do we take the ideas of other people? How do we use them in our own work? Now, there's, uh, there's no specific question for this, but what I'd like you to do is, in the chat box, put any questions you might have for the panel. And if you start your question with a Q, then we'll recognize it and we'll try and cover as many as we can at the end of this, uh, this topic. So we're gonna go to Paul first. And um, those of you who join us on Student Hub Live in the workshops know I've got a number of catchphrases I like to use. And one of my catchphrases is, I don't care what you think, I care what you can demonstrate that the evidence shows. So that's what I want Paul to expand on. This idea that your personal opinion is not the thing we're after. So over to you, Paul. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's, um, I think it's, it's uh, people come into university study with this notion that they can give free reign to their personal views and prejudices and ideas and you know actually it doesn't matter because I'm being creative and unfortunately uh, what that does is it um, it really amounts to a load of unsupported assertions that uh, yeah in there is a you know there is some degree of objective reality and um, I mean I'm a, I'm a, a football supporter I often go to see Queen's Park Rangers and the Queen's Park Rangers fans will sing 
every day, every Saturday. Uh, Queen's Park Rangers, they're the great, greatest football team the world has ever seen. And that's not being rude about Queen's Park Rangers. I love them. They're a great side. But actually, objectively, unfortunately, sadly, that isn't the case. You know, even even I going down to Shepherd's Bush, um, you know, know that you know, they're not really the greatest team that the world's, the world's ever seen. But students don't, don't recognise that. And so, so what you have to do is you have to get out of your, your mindset, your way of thinking, back to Lynn's point about don't just wear one hat. And you've got to recognise um, the range of views. And it is difficult to, to say, look, there are, there are lots of different views lots of different ways of thinking about things. What you have to do is to weigh up the pros and cons of each one. And that's what you mean by critical thinking. It's about thinking around the subject. And quite often, there is no one right answer. But as long as it's a supportive answer, as long as it uses evidence, and it comes to a sensible conclusion, that's what university study is all about. So as you say, I mean, when people say to me, I think, or in my opinion, or even worse, the one that I dislike is, I believe. Yeah. And what they're saying there is, look, um, I, I have this, it's an article of faith, I have this uh, inbuilt prejudice about something, and I'm going to use this assignment as a platform to, to share it with you. So it's all about, as, as Lynn says, it's about wearing different hats, weighing up the evidence, and coming to a balanced conclusion. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. No, that's great. We're going to come back to Paul in a second because Paul is uh, one of our team that has worked on the academic conduct office or in the academic conduct office looking at potential cases of plagiarism. Now, at the OU, we're, we're distance learning. We, we're quite separate. We want you to work together and um, get to know other students and learn from other students. But there is a, a fine line between collaborating together where you share ideas and you learn from each other and collusion where you produce an answer together and you compromise the assessments. So uh, I'd like Paul to tell us a little bit about his, his experiences dealing with potential plagiarism cases. Okay, thanks, Rob. Yes, uh, I did that for about a year. Um, well, I think on the, on the collaboration thing, um, the OU has always encouraged students to collaborate and to work together. Um, back in back in the old days, I mean, back in my days, um, when we did our first tutorials, I mean, it was it was seen as good practice that you got together in a room in a hotel or wherever it was, and you drew a map of the region and you got people to introduce themselves and you showed them where they all lived. And then you encouraged them to form what were called study groups. Um, the, these usually happened in pubs in my experience, but or wine bars or coffee bars these days. And people would get together and say, oh gosh, you know, I don't understand Port's Five Forces or Mintzberg's Five, whatever it might be. And they would all sit around having coffee or something stronger. And it's just like being a student in a, in a regular university. I used to say, I didn't understand that. And some of my friends or my flatmate would say, look, this is how it works, OK? And out of that, there was, I got a better understanding. That is collaboration. Collusion is when actually it goes beyond that. and. I would say that the, 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 the fine line is, are you writing in your own words or are you using the words of others? If you're writing in your own words, that's fine. That's what we want. But as soon as you start um, putting in or using uh, the words of others in large amounts, um, that's when you get into difficulties. And, and the example I always enjoy telling people is um, uh, at one point we, we got, I got, I got uh, three identical assignments. One was from the north of England, one was from Wales, and one was from London. And I looked at these and they were word for word identical. 
and there's a process you have to go through. So I wrote to all these students and said, well, uh, I've got this situation where your assignment is identical to two others. And uh, two of these people wrote back to me and said, uh, well, I don't understand this. I have never spoken to any student in whichever area it was, blah, de, blah, de, blah. And the third one wrote back and said, dear Mr. Ketchley, I'm shocked and stunned to receive your email because um, I bought this from a reputable website who assured me that there was no plagiarism. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, and, 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 and uh, I, think, I think the thing is this, you know, plagiarism is a huge industry. I mean, unfortunately, sadly, for a lot of people, it's easier to copy than it is to do what we said to read the sources, make notes, uh, weigh things up, create the arguments. And so because, and it's all about confidence. You have to have the confidence to do that. But the easy solution is to copy it, buy it. Unfortunately, there are a whole load of websites out there who tell you that they're there to help you. And uh, don't worry, this is not plagiarism. We guarantee it. Um, and they take money from you. Uh, and it's that's that's you know it's tempting people people find it safer sometimes um, to do that than to take the risk and and do what Lynn was saying what the others have been saying about actually reading the material doing this difficult thing about well, it's difficult to weigh it up I agree that and then then as I say the key thing is make sure that you write the answer in your own words. Yeah. Don't copy chunks. Don't copy and paste things. Um, make sure it's your assignment and not somebody else's. Um, as I say, the uh, I have to say that the guy that uh, sent me the email, you know, the one that said I put, uh, I saw him a couple of years later. I didn't actually meet him, but he, I, I saw him in a student conference on a level three course, and. Um, Actually, I, I hope he got through it. I mean, I think he learned that learned the lesson. Uh, the other two, I believe, just disappeared. So, you know, it's a good example, isn't it? It's um, he did the wrong thing, but he learned from it. So good for him. Yeah. And I, I think that example really shows a, an understanding of what plagiarism is, is quite key. And I know that there are some links that are being put into the chat box and there are some, um, some advice for where you can go to get more advice on uh, some of these ideas. So I'm, I've noticed a couple of questions are popping up around how we use other people's ideas. So I'm going to go over to Lynn, and Lynn's going to talk to you about how we can create an argument using these different ideas, and then how we can use ideas to support an argument. Okay, so over to you, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we tell our students in the law school that we don't want a bold statement. So um, a bold statement, um, you know, it's an assertion that's unsupported by any any evidence. So uh, I, I love chocolate. So maybe uh, I, I might say to you that um, uh, dark chocolate is much better for you than milk chocolate. That's 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 my view. Uh, why should you believe me? Who who am I? Um, what we want you to do is to back up that assertion. Be pretend you you know any of you have got any toddlers, any young children, they will have gone through this why stage. So every time you make an assertion in an assignment, imagine you've got this toddler, you've got somebody else, you've got me, you've got Paul, you've got Margaret, you've got your tutor there saying why. Why has this student said this? So think of that little word, because. I have said this because. And then give the support that with your evidence, uh, your ideas from, well, often in, in, in my case, the, the, the law from other judges, from case law, but it could be from peer reviewed articles. Um, of course, you're using somebody else's idea. You'll put it in your own words, but you have to acknowledge that. And that gives it, that makes it 
trustworthy. That makes um, that makes me, the reader, um, understand why you're making that argument, and it's got some force behind it. Um, so that's what we want you to do. And of course, um, as I think one of the questions from the chat box was earlier, um, there will be an awful lot written about one topic. So how do you choose between different views, between different things to use? Um, this comes down to the idea of distilling what you read, really understanding it, really understanding your topic and pulling out the particular bits that relate to what you're talking about. So going back to my dark chocolate and light chocolate, if I was looking at a study that compared maybe dark chocolate, milk chocolate and um, white chocolate, I would not want to, that would be pointless me putting in, in my assignment or backing up my argument with anything from that source about white chocolate, because the question or, or the statement, the assertion was specifically about plain chocolate and milk chocolate. So you'll have you'll have an article, you'll have a case, you'll have some research, whatever in front of you. So distill it down and take out from that the ideas that support your particular argument. You will have opposing ideas. So look at challenges to your ideas. A really, really strong argument will look at pros and cons. We'll, put, we'll look at things that support your argument. We'll also look at things that um, are against your argument. And then you can count them, you can weigh them up, you can make that critical analysis that, um, that, that, that will produce your answer. And in law, exactly um, as, as Paul said earlier, often there's no right answer. We don't have a script when you're marking your assessments that says this is the conclusion, this is the evaluation that the student must come to. You can argue either way and often I, I will get 20 scripts, there will be um, it, often not 50 50, of, uh, often there's a sway one way or the other, but I will get opposing views. What you get the marks for is the argument that goes behind it, how you've supported it. So a student that hasn't supported it at all will get a low mark. A student that has supported his argument with points that just support that argument will get good marks. But the, 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 the first, the two ones, the higher marks will go to these students who have looked at opposing sides and weighed up that evidence and come to their own conclusion. OK. Thank you, Lynn. And I can't agree more. Um, it's very not only possible, it happens all the time where we give full marks to completely opposite answers. Mm. Because the marks are not for is the answer correct, it's how did you get to the argument, how, uh, mm -hmm. the answer, how did you support it, what process did you go through. And again, it's this skill of using other people's ideas. Uh, those of you who are regulars on Student Hub Live may have thought we were being haunted by Isabella then with the comments on dark chocolate and the fact that white chocolate oh. isn't really chocolate <laughs> at all. <laughs> that's, a, that's, oh, a, right. that's a running theme through Student Hub Live, so you fit in really well there, Lynn. So, I don't know that. Isabella. That was, uh, <laughs> maybe we're all chocolate oh. themes at the OU. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a universal constant. Um, so, Margaret, we've got a couple of questions about paraphrasing. So how do we take okay. somebody else's idea and how do we turn it into our own words? And how do we avoid being accused of pinching it? Okay. Um, well, I think the easiest way to actually paraphrase something is not to start by writing necessarily. I think to think about what would I say in conversation if I've got these three different sources of information and I want to then tell my tutor about it or tell the other students about it. Actually think about, well, if I was in a conversation, what would be the most important point that I would pull out of that to then um, tell my friend about what I've just read? And by thinking through how you tell something about somebody about something, is it changing it from the words of the person that you've read to your own words? 
And once you've done that process, which you can often do out walking, out swimming, usually good to do it while you're doing something physical rather than sitting at your desk. When you come to then sit down at your desk and write, it then becomes a much easier process because you can think, right, well, that's what I would have told somebody and just start typing. And the thing is, you type something and it's not how it's going to necessarily be as it ends up. You then perhaps leave it another bit of time and then come back to it and say, well, I'll change that a little bit to make it closer to the meaning of the thing that I actually read. So it's important to do this for lots of different reasons. The first one is legally. <laughs> if you just copy and paste somebody else's text or um, take their words of the song, you're actually breaking the law because copyright law says that up until 70 years after somebody's death, if you just copy their stuff and put it into your work, um, you are breaking the law. Um, there's also intellectual property rights, which is another bit of the law, um, which covers things like trademarks and things like that. So it's not necessarily just people's words. It can also be their ideas. You have to be really careful. Now, most of the time, it's not going to really involve students. Break. Most of the time, the reason we want you to um, paraphrase is to show that you've understood the material. Because if you just copy and paste somebody else's material, you haven't thought about it. But by having to think through what you're writing and, and clarify it in your own mind and connect together other pieces of information with that piece you're reading, you're proving to your tutor that you have understood the material. And when we're assessing you, that's what we're looking for. Have you understood the material? And I know what um, Paul and Lynn have said about their subject, but kind of it's almost the opposite in science. We're looking for you to pull together people's ideas and make a logical conclusion. And often in our marking scheme, we do have, this is the only answer we will accept. Um, you know, so it's quite a different um, way of looking at um, information in, in the science and engineering. And there isn't always one right answer, but often a marking scheme will say, these are the points we expect the student to have understood. These are what we need them to have rephrased in their own words. Um, and this is the answer we need them to have come to. So um, go through that thought process, um, change it from somebody else's ideas into your own thoughts. You can't necessarily understand it enough to get to that end point. Um, so that's why it's really important to spend time over it, read the source, then spend time away from that source, thinking about how it connects to other things you know, and then come back to do your work and, and pull it together at the end of it. So um, it's a really important skill that you learn. I mean, I'm starting, a, I'm a first year tutor, and it's one of the skills we try and build up in our students, the idea of how do you take somebody else's information and rewrite, rewrite it in your own words without um, losing any of the information. Um, so another thing you can kind of do is have the original information in front of you and have your information in front of you and look at the different points that they've made and the points that you're making and make sure that you haven't missed anything out because otherwise your argument won't build up to the right conclusion. Thank you, Margaret. And uh, I think some really good points there about avoiding just using the words of others. Uh, we tend to give out some tips on using your speech to text on your computers. Uh, one way to avoid plagiarism is to not use your mouse to copy and paste the text. Use mm. the uh, speech function and talk it through in your own words. And then you've got your own words to copy and paste and mess around with. So some suggestions there on how to avoid copying. So HJ, any questions that we haven't covered that are jumping out? Well, we've got lots of great questions in the chat, which is absolutely amazing. Again, we're having this debate, white chocolate versus milk chocolate and dark chocolate. I think, you know, we're never going to get Isabella to lives. This. <laughs> but um, some people brought up cheese as well, but I'm completely avoiding that. Otherwise, we'll be here absolutely all day. So um, there's lots of great questions that um, we'd like to ask our fantastic guests. So Karen asks, what if uh, we as students have an idea and then we find it in a journal or textbook afterwards and someone's already come up with that idea. What do we do in that situation? Have we plagiarized? Should we go back and reference it? What's best to do? Okay, anybody like to take that one? Um, okay, well, I'll give it, I'll start off with that one because this, not necessarily in a textbook, but particularly when we're working on forums, for example, if we ask students to post a unique message in a forum and they post it and find somebody else has already written uh, exactly the same point, how do we um, 
how do we deal with that? And my advice to students is don't read the other people's messages before you post. Yeah, yeah post to yourself and then if you come across one that is almost identical to yours pat yourself on the back because you're either both really good or you've both gone off the same tangent but don't read it first so then you can't be influenced and if it's very similar it just means you're on the same wavelength so paul did you have something to add to that well yeah i was i was going to say it does seem to me that you know that there, there is so much written these days i mean so much written somewhere everywhere that it's impossible not you know to be to have a unique idea it's yeah you know, someone's bound to have it have had it as well um i remember going to uh, i used to work in in uh, in kent and i i went to our partner organization in um north Pas de calais in lille and we had this it system and uh, they showed me their it system and I realized it was virtually identical. And we sat there and we had lunch. And I said to this guy, who was a good friend of mine now, I said, you know what? It just shows that if you give intelligent people the same problem, <laughs> quite probably they're going to come out with a pretty similar solution. So, so any idea that you've had isn't going to be that, that unique. If, if, you, if you came up with it and you, the next day you 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 saw a source, you know, if, if someone famous said it or someone that looked recognized, then you might want to say, oh, I just noticed, actually, so-and-so says this. But I would say if you've come up with an idea and it's based on something and you've expressed it in your own terms, that's fine. The fact that you subsequently find that somebody else has had the same idea or written the same thing, you know, that's going to happen because there is so much knowledge and and academic papers out there these days you know it, it it's difficult for you to come up with something that is truly original and in fact mm -hmm. you know most most when you do as, a, as an aco when you look at assignments um everyone's assignment contains a certain percentage up to about 10 12 where where you know what they say matches other assignments or books or whatever you know if i said if i started an assignment uh, and i said uh, for people in people in europe world war ii began in 1939 i'm sure that's been said thousands and thousands and thousands of times um but you know it doesn't matter because you know i mean i could go on and say but you know people in china it started in 1930 and that I could then bring in some sources and do what we've been saying people could do here. But it's very difficult not to, it's very difficult not to say something that hasn't been said somewhere already. Absolutely. We, um, we struggle to come up with anything truly unique. So Margaret, did you want to add something to that? Um, I think it's just the nature of creativity that we build our ideas on other people's. It's where we started really building on the shoulders of giants that particularly in science, it can happen that three or four research groups are all working on the same thing at the same time. <laughs> and there's a race for them to actually be the first ones to publish and be acknowledged. Um, but all their research is equally valid. Um, it's just a question of the fact that because they're all building on the same information to start off with, you're going to come up with the same ideas at the same time. And, and it's just the nature of the world, it's the way creativity works. Absolutely. Thank you for that, uh, that, Margaret. Now we're going to move on to topic three. This is a uh, next time you need to give me um, me two hours. We can't do it an hour. Uh, topic three. Um, how do we acknowledge the ideas of others? Now, there's a question coming across the screen now um, that's asking you, why do you think we should reference? And if you've got any specific questions on referencing, you can pop them in. Now, this isn't a how to reference session. And I know my colleagues in the chat box are putting some um, links in, so the library resources that give some great ideas. Um, so what I want to do is I want to, to go around the team and we'll uh, ask for any examples or any top tips for citing sources. So we'll keep it nice and short. We've only got 10 minutes left. So uh, we'll come to you first then, Lynn. Um, 
Uh, so any top yeah. tips or any really well, good examples of perhaps where referencing has gone wrong? <laughs> well, first of all, um, the, the, the first um, uh, question there, why, why should we reference? Going back right to the beginning, it's not my opinion. When I was in court, it's not my opinion that the judge is interested in. <laughs> if I can back up my opinion with another judicial decision, then that will, I want to be able to back up my, uh, my, my argument because that is persuasive. That is the way to make the judge come round to my view. So that's one very good uh, reason why you should. But of course, it's because it's persuasive, it helps you to, to make your argument. But of course, it's not your idea. So you've got to acknowledge it. You've got to reference it. I think my top tip would be, as you're doing your reading, um, just note down what you've read and where you've read it, because then you won't lose track um, of of where you of of where you are, and you're not then in in any danger of thinking that something was your idea when actually you've read it before. Because I think it was Paul who was saying, or somebody was saying, one one way to avoid it is to not read other things before you before you write. So if you make a note all the way along as to where you've read things, uh, then you can quickly go back and reference the things in your work that you've actually used. Absolutely. And it makes the referencing at the end so much easier. Mm. When I was a student, I think I, I was in a bad habit. I used to do the referencing at the end. And it used <laughs> to take me as long to go back and find those references yeah. again as it did to write yeah. the assignment in the yeah. first place. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, experienced students will all say, create your reference list as you go along. It's easier to cross off the things you don't need than to find the things you used before. Uh, so, Margaret, any tips, any suggestions um, from you on referencing? Just as a follow up on that, there's a bit of software that's free called Zotario Bib. I think um, Nicola's going to pop it in the chat box for you. Um, and it's a way of keeping track of those things. I think for me, the important thing is going back to how you link back to those primary sources. And I, when I would be referencing something, I would not only look at the reference itself, I would also look at where they've got the information from. So I would look at their referencing and work backwards and say, well, this particular source, even in Wikipedia, people are saying about Wikipedia. If you go into Wikipedia, at the bottom of the page is actually a list of references. So I would say, well, this is where I'm starting from. I'll have a quick look at where they got that information from. So for me, the important thing is to make sure I not only understand the actual reference, but also their providence, how they've proved that they've got that evidence. Um, and that for me, that's that link back to that primary source. How do they link back? And how do I make sure that the information I'm using makes that link all the way back to the primary source? Um, and, you know, Wikipedia itself can do that. Um, all sorts of other sources can do. Um, and a particular source may actually be at different levels. So I had an example of a PhD thesis you'll have primary information there, the person thinks that they've been investigating themselves. You'll have secondary stuff, the papers that they've read themselves and referenced within their thesis. You'll have tertiary resources where they've looked. And you'll also have things that they remember from when they did their lectures as a student, they've stuck in their thesis, um, which basically is coming down to the level of hearsay and, and um, um, gossip. So you have to have a look at not only what the source is, but also which part of the source you're taking when you're doing your referencing. So there's a lot of information there to actually work on to make sure your referencing is good. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. Brilliant. So, Paul, we've got a couple of minutes if you'd like to give us some of your top sure. tips on referencing. Sure. Um, it's always difficult to come last on these things, isn't it? Because you know, <laughs> other things that people have said the things that you want to say. I mean, I think that I would, I would say, look, um, people get people overdo it sometimes, and what they do is they think, oh, I've got, I've got to produce a long list of references because this is going to impress my tutor, and unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't because. I always ask myself, have you actually read this stuff? If you reference something, you are saying, I personally have read this book, opened it, um, read this article, da 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 And sometimes, I mean, I, I often see a reference in my subject of a book that I happen to know is difficult to obtain in the United Kingdom because I tried to get it once and it took me months. So I think, 
have you really looked at this? So I would say my top tip is always reference your sources and not your sources' sources. So don't go to the end of a book or an article that you read and think, oh, I can just cut and, cut and paste this reference list and stick it in my assignment and my tutor will be dead impressed because quite often you think, I don't believe this. I don't believe this. So most recently, um, someone quoted from an article that I've, I've read multiple times. I've got it on my computer in PDF form. And he said, this character said, uh, uh, this author, 2008, says, open quotes, put in a quote. And I looked at it and I thought, I don't remember that being there. I, have, I, have I missed something? Have I, have I missed it all these years? And so I opened it on my computer and I could do this. And hey, presto, it's not there. And you think, look, don't, don't do this. You know, reference your actual sources, not your sources' sources, and don't overdo it. If you haven't looked at whatever it is, don't claim that you have. Say, uh, in, the, in the Open University material, it refers to this. So it's, it's a secondary reference. But people, I think people think that they have to put a, you know, it's, it's a scale job. You know, you, you pile on the references and the tutor's bound to give you a big tick. Well, unfortunately, yeah. sometimes I look at it and I think, what's all this got to do with it? What's this got to do with, it, with the price of beans? Mm -hmm. And um, I would say we're far more interested in your use of academic ideas than your data sources. You know, I mean, we're, it's much more important to me to, to say, look, this is the source of my ideas than the source of your data. But as I say, my, my top tip is always, always uh, use, always reference your sources and not your sources' sources. Yeah, on B three hundred two, which is a module I, I work on, we have um, we we use a live case study, and students are pointed to a particular website or a particular report that they could use. And it's really funny when students just copy the reference from the module. And me being the the generous, open person that I am, I always put the Saki comment. Didn't you do well to read this article three months before mm. you, the course actually started? Um, which always makes me smile. But yeah, use the correct reference and use yeah. the one that you use. Uh, so, HJ, over to you for any last comments from the um, chat box. Well, there's so much going on in the chat. I think we'd find it hard to cover in the last couple of minutes. But there's so many great ideas and great things that people are sharing and tools, which is absolutely fantastic. So thank you for sharing and letting us know your ideas, what resources you use. There's lots of resources we've talked about as well. Nicola and Amanda have put in the chat. And you can find all of those on the session page, which I'll post in the chat as well, or on Student Hub. Uh, .open.ac.uk. Um, in the meantime, there are some questions that we probably won't be able to get to, but you can always catch us on our email, studenthub at open.ac.uk. And uh, there's lots of great uh, resources from the library and they've got their own sessions as well. And you can check out our website for our previous sessions because previously we talked about referencing and acknowledging ideas. We've talked about uh, general knowledge and putting things in our own words as well. So there's lots of great things out there, but uh, it's been great chatting to everyone. Lots of great things shared in the chat. And I do look forward to chatting to everyone next time as well. Thank you, HJ. And I'd just like to remind you all that we run the Student Hub Live uh, workshops regularly on a lot of topics. And some of the questions I'm glancing down, uh, such as how to focus on the question, how to write a good essay, how to think critically, these are all workshop sessions we've run. They're all recorded, so go to the website and have a look, and you'll see some really good advice there. And um, you'll yeah, you'll see some uh, fun and games that we have along the way as well. So thank you everyone. And um, we're just about run out of time. So I'd like to thank my guests. Thank you, Paul, Margaret, Lynn, um, for your input and the time that you spent getting this together. 
And uh, thank you to Amanda and to Nicola on the chat. And HJ, as always, you're a star. So it's been a great session. Hope you've enjoyed it, everyone. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you very much.